Hello, everyone. I'm Matt Mitrovich, the alternate historian, and with me today is Tom Black. Tom, say hi to everybody. Hi, everybody. <laughs> and Tom, so introduce yourself. If no one's ever met you before, how would you describe yourself as? Oh, goodness. Um, well, I'm a, a writer and publisher from South London. Um, I grew up in Croydon, if you know South London well, and I've, in fact, last month I moved to Balham. Um, in an alternate history sense, alternate history sense, I am the uh, founder of Sea Lion Press, uh, the home of alternate history publishing, uh, and I'm also an author. Um, I mean, I've, I've written a few things. I've collaborated with uh, a guy called Jack Tyndale on a number of quite successful books, um, mainly Agent Lavender is the one we've received the most acclaim for, and uh, but I've also written a large number of short stories. Uh, and in my various day jobs, um, I'm uh, a playwright, and uh, also I work for a newspaper. So uh, words, words, words is kind of my life, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you definitely have the life I always wanted. But uh, <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, if writing sounds a lot more interesting than being a conflicts attorney. But anywho, uh, so tell me about Sea Lion Press, because, uh, I, I, you know, I've seen some of your books. You know, I, see, I know a lot of the writers on there, but, you know, our listeners might not know. So what is Sea Lion Press? To kind of describe it, its history, that kind of stuff. Sure. Well, Sea Lion Press uh, is a publishing house, uh, to use the technical term. Um, we were founded in uh, July 2015. Obviously, we had the idea a few months before that. And I guess to go right back to the start, when I say we, I'm talking about a group of authors and users on alternatehistory.com. Um, I'm sure many of your listeners will be familiar with that website. It's, um, I'm pretty sure, far and away the largest alternate history discussion forum. Uh, and it's where I really got into the genre uh, myself. Uh, though, there we go, I've called it a genre again, as I was saying before we started recording. I'm trying to get out of the habit of calling it a genre because it's a setting. You can have lots of different okay. types of book, which I'll come to in a moment, actually, in terms of the, the different varieties of, of genre we publish in our, in our alternate history books. Um, anyway, it was alternatehistory.com where we all met. And effectively, um, via things like the Turtle Dove Awards, which is the online awards for the website where, you know, particularly good pieces of writing and clever ideas are rewarded every year uh, via public vote and just conversations with people and people I'd come to know and, and just, I don't know, I, I feel I arrived at alternatehistory.com at quite a good time. It was a bit of a golden age of writing. There were a number mm -hmm. of great timelines being posted and regularly updated. And I kind of just, kind of just had the thought, the brainwave really, um, that uh, people would probably pay good money to read these if they didn't have to scroll through a, a forum and, and read them on like, a, you know, on a, on a, on their phone or on their computer. What if we could get them onto 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 Kindle format or another ebook mm -hmm. reader? And would people be out there interested in, in reading it and in, in paying money for it? That was that was the thing. So I contacted a few of the authors. Uh, we st and, and pretty soon we started with our first catalogue of just six books. Um, and uh, it turned out the answer was yes. There were people out there who were interested in, uh, in in reading alternate history books that had been written by people who maybe they'd never heard of, but had been posting on online forums and you know refining their works. All of our titles are not just copied and pasted from the forum. You know they're they're proofread, obviously, but also they are edited and kind of redrafted. Um, and in some cases, people go back to stuff they wrote a few years ago and tweak it and things like that. So you know we wanted to publish kind of quality alternate history stuff. We didn't want to just copy and paste from. Um, uh, from the internet and all that and uh, yeah so it's it, it now you know fast forwarding two years we've just published I think our 50th book um, wow. and we're yeah thank you we're, we're very very pleased about that um, it's gone very well I'm, I'm going to be terribly English about the the business and the money side of it but you know we're still here we're down we're doing well as far as I'm concerned and uh, we are yeah we're, we're having a great time and we've I mean obviously having had 50 books we've now I think got something like 30 authors so starting with I think four people and six books we've gone kind of gone through the roof a little bit there and uh, showing no signs of really slowing down you know we've, we've published a lot of the the really popular timelines on alternatehistory.com have now been published through us or are being published things like look to the west by tom anderson that is a, a, an epic tale and now i think right now it's longer than about it is longer than war and peace uh and so <laughs> we've published the first we've published the first two volumes of that and i think there are right now six volumes and i don't know when it's ever going to end so i'm very pleased to be publishing that one um but uh, anyway i'm sure i'll be doing lots of, of name drops throughout but you know some some quite big names on alternatehistory.com um you know like uh, ed, people like ed thomas as say thomas anderson um we've just published uh, uh, something by um, dun, 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 dun. looking very good here. Oh, of course, yes, we've just published Reds by uh, by Jane Hill, 
uh, which is the story that many alternate history.com users will know as uh, the, the tale of a revolutionary America in the early mm -hmm. 20th century, having a, not exactly the same arc as Russia did, because Russia and America are very different places at the start <laughs> of the 20th century, as indeed they still are, but it does end up having a, a successful communist revolution. And uh, without giving too much away beyond that, it's uh, it's a great read. It's a really good read. And uh, yeah, very pleased to have that. That's one of that's probably the most recent kind of famous inverted commas alternate history dot com timeline that we've published. Um, but I guess having having mentioned that site for the sort of the eighteenth time, I should say that we have also published things from other uh, other writers. We've we've been contacted by people since the brand has got out there. Um, speaking of the brand, we've got uh, a very distinctive style of of cover which has been very popular. Um, mm -hmm. I actually approached my colleague Jack, I mentioned him earlier, is the guy I've co-written some books with. Uh, he's got a great graphic design background and he he just does this very cool minimalist style. And, and one of the things I, th I noticed when we were looking up um, existing alternate history stories online um, that were available on Amazon, for example, through ebook formats, uh, was that the covers uh, tended to be a little bit unimaginative. Nothing really stood out. Um, you know, there were some nice things in there. There were, you know, there were some okay ones. I'm not sort of having a go at anybody, but I thought, right, if we want to kind of have a brand that stands out here, that kind of looks the same but is also exciting and distinct, a kind of minimalist style that avoids having to use photographs, because of course, if you're publishing things, you're going to need photos if you want to have like realism on your on your covers in in terms of history style books. So we went completely the other way because you need to pay money for decent photos, or you end up using the same public domain photos over and over again. And and it starts to look a bit rubbish. So uh, we've ended up, yeah, with this quite cool uh, minimalist style. We get quite a few um, little emails, you know, praising us for that. In fact, one guy wrote to us, um, and he'd actually redone all of them himself by hand as kind of an art project. He'd uh, copied copied all of our covers out and coloured them all in, which was really cool to see. Um, but anyway, as I say, we, we created this brand. It's been up and running for two years, and I'm very pleased to say uh, that we've got other authors that I didn't know through alternatehistory.com just emailed us saying, "Hey, I'd like to be part of Sea Lion Press, please. I, you know, can I will you read my manuscript?" And uh, in some cases, we have said no because some things haven't been suitable. But uh, I'm very pleased right. to say that things like uh, Time Wreck Titanic by uh, Rhys Davies uh, has has just come out recently, and uh, that's been a big success. And that was one that didn't come from the website, um, though he made himself aware to me, uh, made, made, made me aware of him by contacting me via email. And George Kitten's uh, the House of Stuart sequence, which, uh, if you like the House of Stuart, the uh, people who were run off the English throne. Uh, sorry, the, sorry, the British throne. No, it wasn't quite the British <laughs> throne, was it? It was 1688. Um. Anyway, the, the Stuarts, Char you know, uh, James, Charles, all those guys. Uh, when they were kicked off, and then we had the Jacobite Risings. So George has written an excellent series exploring the, um, the, the successful Jacobite Rising and the return of the Stuarts. And uh, he is somebody who I didn't know through alternatehistory.com, but got in touch and said, yeah, I'd, I'd love to love to publish my books through... Uh, Sea Lion Press, and uh, well, it was a match made in heaven. Yeah, I mean, I, I when I first heard about Sea Lion Press, I was just really excited because I've always thought there was just some great alternate history online, but it was hard to get people to read it because not many people want to just look at a forum all day. Exactly. And, and yeah, and it's like no matter how many times I recommended it, people just would just sort of their eyes would glaze over. They just weren't mm. interested. I, I found and, myself copying and pasting stuff and like making my own PDFs that I would then upload yeah. to my iPad and, and just sit there reading it on the train. And I thought there's got to be a better way than this. And yeah. I've done that so many times too. And when people <laughs> would like send it like, hey, Matt, can you read this? And I'm like, sure. And they would just give me a link to the forum. I'm like, eh, can you, is there another, like, is there a document mm. you could send me? Because it'd be so much easier to read this if I could actually just read it like a normal, like, book or ebook or something like yeah. that and but anyway but when i saw you guys were doing this i was really excited because it's just like yes this is had to be done so i'm happy someone was finally doing it and when i saw Thank your you. guys's covers <laughs> i was like wow because i love that minimalist art style I, especially when it comes to like maps and stuff like that oh yeah i love it you. sometimes when people you know sometimes it, how do I put this? Some some some, some alternate history maps can be so busy and just so like oh mm -hmm. god. But sometimes when the, the 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 minimalist style makes it so much better, and that's something that I remember reading this uh, article, this a uh, scholarly article when I was doing research on this paper about the the history of online alternate historians, oh. which maybe one of these days I'll actually publish. I have no idea, but one of the the article was pointing out that one of the things that makes alternate history like you know popular and what gets people to want to read it uh is the cover design because yeah. people will see these like really covers that sort of just catch the eye and make you do a double take that's kind of what got me into the uh, genre yes itself. sort of um uh, tom anderson who i mentioned he he calls that i think it's oh, chronausia is a term he's come up with it recently where like you feel you feel slightly odd looking at an image that's that seems out of time or anachronistic or just wrong somehow 
Um, yeah. You know, it, like, I mean, Man in the High Castle, the Amazon series, used that to great effect with just like the image mm -hmm. of the Statue of Liberty with swastika banners on it. Is immediately exactly. like, whoa, hang on, that's not right. But it's also not aliens. It's not like conjuring up images of, of sci-fi. It's something. It's two things you recognize in our of being of our world, but colliding in a way that you're not sure about and in fact in that and certainly in that instance maybe not very comfortable with so you want to know how that's happened yeah and that's that's how it worked for me because that i saw the paperback of uh, world war in the balance ah uh, that was my first yeah. ah too oh that's awesome it's, yeah. it, i've heard a lot of people say that's their first <laughs> ah and i th and i think it's because you just see winston churchill and adolf hitler standing next to each mm -hmm. other like wait a second that doesn't make yeah. any sense before you even and realize that it's about aliens you're interested <laughs> exactly exactly and so it's like just seeing seeing some of those covers of yours is yeah. just is really they got the eye-catching covers that's something like a lot of like mainstream publishers big publishers don't seem to get because oftentimes they get these covers for books that seem sort of like eh, like i'm reading <laughs> right now um uh alan, alan smalls alan smith i know i don't know if i'm pronouncing his name right uh he's got this trilogy of books where um the rome never fell and they eventually uh reached north america and you know they're fighting with the the Native Americans there, and a lot of his covers, while they look good, it's usually just someone's face, and they don't look, they're not eye catching. If I didn't already know there was an alternate history, I probably would just think this is, is some period piece historical fiction yes you know and it's just like i would love to see like covers that are a little bit more jarring a little bit more like this doesn't seem right uh and so i would love that's why you know that's why i so sometimes say in my videos it's like in some of the articles i write it's like i'm getting really upset sometimes when these mainstream publishers sort of like are just lazy about the, the graphics they use because there's so many great artists out there yeah. uh, in the alternate history community who would do it for you know affordable affordable price yeah, uh, that definitely these companies could afford yeah. if they just you know just reached out to the community of people but yeah. anyhow like, that's a whole other thing we could talk about yeah. so but yeah so yeah that's that's sort of like where i'm coming from with sea line press i was very excited to find out about it but i want to get back to something you said earlier yeah. that we talked about before we started and you don't want to call alternate history a genre now i refer to alternate history as yeah. genre all the time yeah. but you call it a <laughs> setting so what's yeah. the difference well, between the, a setting and a genre well uh, and th this is where if we crack open the dictionary i might be revealed to be a complete charlatan but I've, uh, I've, as I say, as I'm say, I'm, tr I'm trying to get into the habit of, of, of saying it like this because I've realised that if I, if I look at, uh, for example, just picking a page at random, if I went to say slash our books uh, where I believe there are a number of excellent titles available at a reasonable price, you can see that we have published. Um, if I just look at the right now, where I've got a a political, uh, two political fiction books, um, I've got a spy thriller. Uh, we've got a story of a, fu a future history story of, of humankind trying to survive after a, a man-made apocalypse, uh, a series of, of articles, some of them presented like newspapers, uh, a kind of sci-fi thriller about uh, the Titanic, um, and a history book style book about uh, the Stuarts that I mentioned. Uh, oh, and a, and a kind of pulpy military uh, Tom Clancy style story um, about uh, a, a jet combat over Canada. Now, all of the only thing those all have in common is their alternate history. They're actually quite different genres in terms of fiction. Like, uh, a, I, I guess it's because I'm thinking of like, you know, genre in the sense of of like, if, if we talk about it in film, like, you know, uh, The Matrix and Fury are both action films, but they have very different settings. Mm -hmm. Whereas, just to expand on this a bit, I guess, uh, like. Um, what's that movie about Bletchley Park? I don't know. One of the you know, one of those code-breaking movies from World War II and Saving Private Ryan are both set in World War II, but they're very different movies. They're different pace, they're different style, um, and different genres. So it's not the most sophisticated point in the world, but I think it just it's kind of useful. And possibly well, you you touched a moment ago on like pu mainstream publishers being uh, a little bit lazy in their approach to alternate history. I think that's absolutely right. There's a lot of misunderstanding of it. Um, mm -hmm. I think that could partly be it. It's kind of seen as a kind of subgenre of sci-fi or um, fantasy, uh, which I have time for. I, I get I get why it's put in those places in bookshops, and I don't think I'm going to win any wars trying to change mm -hmm. that. But I think if if people start to realise that it's a setting like any other, like you know when 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 Shakespeare was writing, and I'm not comparing alternate history to plays by Shakespeare, um, certainly nothing I've written, but when Shakespeare gets the details wrong of where, you know, like in uh, in A Winter's Tale, when they take a boat to Bohemia, like, 
that you know technically that's some further history because he's going to a fictional Bohemia where apparently there's a big coastline, but they mm. don't do that of course. They don't. People don't see it that way. They they don't you know. So I don't know. I've kind of rambled a little bit there, but hopefully you see my point of like if it, I think it would possibly be good for the setting of alternate history if more people saw it as just a setting. And I actually I'd say. The, like the recent uh, surge in popularity it's seen on on television, um, is uh, is is going to potentially help it in that direction, because um, you know you've got things like Man in the High Castle, uh, SSGB in the UK showing mm. that for example SSGB is a good example like it was like a, almost a straightforward detective story it just happened to involve the Nazis occupying Britain, um, mm. and that will hopefully have shown that you don't have to do an alternate history story that is all about how the alternate history came to be. Like you know things like the butterfly effect or something like that. There are a lot mm. of great stories that are like, that involve somebody in a different universe discovering how that universe came to be different from ours. That's great, and mm. that's definitely a, a a genre. That is definitely a genre of, of fiction. But there's actually a lot of fiction now that is just happens to be in that different world, and it's almost less about how that world became different to ours, but what happens next. Like um, I don't know. I'm now going to shamelessly talk about something I wrote myself, but Agent Lavender. Uh, is about the British Prime Minister Harold Wilson being unmasked as a Soviet spy. Now, of course, he wasn't a spy in real life, so that is a different world to ours. But we don't mm -hmm. spend a huge amount of time exploring how he became a spy. We have a couple of scenes that, you know, explain it, and I won't give anything away. But what's more interesting, certainly to Jack and I when we were writing it, was what would that world look like? What what kind of world, what kind of Britain, and what kind of America, what kind of Soviet Union emerges when that kind of revelation hits the world stage? So. There we are. That's kind of why I think uh, alternate history is, 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 is probably more of a setting than it is a genre, because the genre of alternate history is those books, those films, those stories where it is about how the history became different to ours. I guess that's, that's the, the nub of my point. No, I, I get what you're saying, because it's really easy just to say to people, alternate history is a subgenre of science fiction, and uh -huh. most people are like, okay, yeah, that's what, that makes sense. But at the same time, depending on the story, it really doesn't. Like, if you're dealing with, like, time travel or parallel I was about to say, it conjures up images of time travel when you say yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that is like, yeah, that's science fiction is right. But what if it's just magic exists? All right, that's probably more fantasy. And what if yeah. there is no sci-fi or fantasy elements it's just like you said a detective story in the middle of uh, britain that's occupied by the nazis mm. that's more almost more historical fiction which yeah. is has nothing to do with sort of genre fiction in many ways so it's just like it, i guess you're right it's kind of a setting i think a comparison to it is maybe like i would say almost arguably is like the comic book craze that's going on right now especially oh. in films yes where you have superheroes you can have a captain america fighting uh you know a nazis who uh have infiltrated american government it turns into a spy thrower or yes. you can have just a fun light-hearted space opera like the guardians of the galaxy yep. it's all superhero and films they're doing heist they movies can... now with ant-man you know you're exactly right. yeah it's it, superhero movies have gone beyond the classic every movie is the origin story then a couple of low-level things and then a big baddie that they have to fight because the baddie is going to destroy the city or the world that was yeah. more superhero like pretty much all superhero movies were that until about five years ago even the early Marvel ones, when you look back on them, they're all kind of that. Um, mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right. Yeah, that's that's yeah, yeah that format. Yeah, so that's that's a good example. Definitely good, good uh, similar example. Yeah, and now while some people might argue that we're kind of splitting hairs between genre and setting, but but we're, we're, you know whatever. Yeah, we're, we're, we're nerds. Come on, we're, <laughs> we're about alternate history on a podcast. I don't think any anybody came here not expecting hairs to be split somewhere along the line. Exactly, exactly. But yeah, and. I'm I'm excited for one thing about this sort of like golden age of ultra history television that we seem to be getting into. Yeah. I mean I think I think Man the High Castle deserves a lot of the credit for being as successful as it was because oh. it's gotten a lot of uh, other uh, networks. So oh. far more of the more of the like premier networks or like you know in none, in none of the well I guess NBC's got timeless so I, I shouldn't say that oh. but that just okay yeah canceled, I think. it got renewed though it is coming oh, it back from oh, okay, the season. Great. Yeah, yeah. It, it, after the whole like uproar on social media, NBC was like, "No, no, no, Brilliant. we're coming back for another season." Oh, that's good news. So, okay. I should get into yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so NBC's got Timeless. Amazon's got The Man in the High Castle. And then, of oh. course, uh, HBO just announced well, uh, Confederate. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have the Confederate conversation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we might as well. Everyone yeah. else is having. It. Let's do it. I'll try not to say anything that destroys my business for good. No, oh, um, don't worry. <laughs> um, you can say whatever you want. I'm sure no. I'm sure no one on YouTube will care that much. It's not like they ever get excited about anything. Um, 
the comment sections are always peaceful places yeah, where everyone treats each other with respect. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so HBO uh, announced Confederate, and this is this is. I mean, it's not like we haven't had someone take uh, the idea of the South winning the Civil War to the big or small screen. Uh, uh-huh. There was that mockumentary uh, was. CSA. Yeah. That uh, everyone seems to you know look pretty kindly on. And it sounds uh, like that was kind of making the same point that this one is going to. But in like a better way. Well, anyway, let's. You're, you're doing you're doing a little background on Confederate, so I won't interrupt. That's useful to kind of have this background before we go on. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, in case anyone who hasn't watched my own video on mm. it, uh, the guys behind uh, uh, Game of Thrones, well, the showrunners for Game of Thrones, not George R. R. Martin himself, are coming up with the show. And, and apparently, from what I've read, they uh, they were planning to do this as a movie, but eventually decided it would work better as a television series, and. Uh, They've gotten this couple, uh, I forget their first names, I know their last names are the Spellmans, uh, they're, they're African Americans who have worked in uh, worked in television on many successful shows who are working with them as both writers and executive producers, and so it's about, it's just, it's just really what you think it is, the pretty much standard, the South wins the Civil War, they get their independence, and slavery now exists to the modern day. Uh, we could talk about how plausible that is, but, uh, so yeah, I'm sure you've heard about it, what, what's, what's your opinions on the show? My yeah, I mean, firstly, I was um, to go back to CSA, the movie you mentioned. Um, mm. I, I I like CSA. You know, it it is CSA is not trying to be hard alternate history. It is actually no. like in in the same way that a lot of the, the, like all great sci-fi is really about right now. Um, CSA was like a you know it's 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 a look at a a high because because in CSA it's crazy, isn't it? It's like the CSA, the, the South wins and then takes over the North isn't it? Like, there isn't a US anymore. Like, so not only does slavery still exist, but the entirety of America just suddenly becomes massively racist and, and, and loves slavery so much and keeps it going for the, for the forever. But, like, the point it's making is not this is a historical documentary. It's saying look at how kind of familiar a lot of this is. Look at how, mm. you know, and they were clever, you know, slightly on the nose satire at times, but it's kind of making a point about race in America um, exactly. that, I'm, you know, this show sounds like the Confederate, it sounds like it's going to try to do um, but it seems to be, well, from what I've seen, it looks like it's going to do it in quite a serious way of like, yeah, look, if the South had won and there was this like this this rogue slave state south of south of the U.S., you know, and it kept slavery going, and that I, for me, it's just that's where it falls down because I am I'm afraid, you know, the, the the great thing about alternate history is nobody can ever be completely right about anything, but I am a mm-hmm. pretty big subscriber to the idea that the South would not have maintained slavery. Um, indefinitely, it certainly wouldn't still have it in 2017. Um, if nothing else, the international pressure would have meant that, that some kind of that, 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 that what we understand as slavery in a 19th century context would have had to disappear. Um, mm. But actually, you know, I kind of take the position. I think Harry Turtledove was talking about this um, a couple of days ago on Twitter, um, and I think I've I, I've kind of subscribed to this view myself before that, you know, it, it, it's it's you know, slavery is, is, is absolutely abhorrent and horrific and unethical and all these, these things that I hope one doesn't need to say. Um, and it's, it has historically been got rid of by societies that don't need it anymore. There, hasn't be, there haven't been societies throughout history that love slavery so much in and of itself that they want to keep it on when they no longer require it, when their economies don't need it anymore. Um, you know, the British Empire, for example, parade, paraded around the world getting rid of slavery when it had decided it didn't need the slave trade anymore because it had factories and, and labour was becoming less of a premium. Um, mm-hmm. So, in short, as this, as this hypothetical surviving CSA continued on, which, by the way, it might not have survived because this economy was in such a bad state anyway, um, mm-hmm. I kind of do subscribe to the view that probably it would have got rid of slavery one way or another by, like, 1900, let alone 2017. Um mm-hmm. Now, I also get that it's hard to, you know, when you look at the, the virulence with which the South fought um, in, in the Civil War for something that was, yeah, ostensibly the cause of slavery, I get why people turn around and go, well, you say that nobody, you know, nobody loves slavery beyond its usefulness. Well, these people seem pretty ideologically committed to it. And I go like, yeah, OK, fair enough. Maybe it would have been something pretty horrible and it lasted, you know, a lot longer than, you know, because wasn't Brazil the last, wasn't Brazil one of the last nations to get rid of slavery in, in reality? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I know they got, I got rid of it after the U.S. did, but yeah. I couldn't say what date it was or whether they were specifically the last one, at least oh, yeah. in the way we understand slavery. Exactly, because there's that the thing, because slavery actually means lots of different things. Yeah, like chattel, yeah. chattel slavery. Yeah. Anyway, that, like, 
when you look at when they got rid of it, and, and yeah. So yeah, I, I hope that hope that makes sense as a, as a point of like on on the plausibility level. I just don't see a, I don't see a Confederate States of America surviving to the present day and having slavery as as, as we understand it in in nineteenth century context. Um, mm-hmm. But actually, I also don't see them having anybody, you know, working for free basically because that's what we call that slavery because that's what it is. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I'm not going to weasel words if I, I think. Yeah. So anyway, but but maybe that's me getting a bit too hung up on a on a specific detail. I think the yeah. um, you know like like if we're talking about the consequences of a of a Confederate. Because don't they also don't they also call it the Third American Civil War is about to break out? Yeah, there's apparently yeah. been three civil wars, yeah. and we have no idea. And that's kind of the problem with Confederate is that they made this announcement, and they didn't give you any real details about the story. Is they, they've mentioned there's no scripts, they have nothing. They just mm. say they're doing this show. Uh, to be honest, they probably announced it because they wanted to keep um, the what is it? Uh, ben, I can't remember their names. Of Benny Hoff and Weiss. Mm. They pro- HBO wanted to make sure they kept them on with their channel instead of going somewhere else. So yeah, they wanted they wanted to get this. Uh, done with but there is almost no detail i mean they say slavery still exists to the modern day but yeah. maybe it's slavery and old but name kind of thing you know what mm. i'm saying maybe like as for the south to survive they changed it they reformed it to make it look a little less like slavery but in mm. the end it's still de facto slavery yeah, to be honest yeah, it could be what interesting in that yeah yeah but we don't know because yeah. there's no details they've obviously yeah. worked on it but they're not releasing much information about what the world is like and maybe yeah. if if the, once they start actually producing the show, because it looks like despite all of the the hubbub over social media, they're still going forward with it. Hey, uh, any publicity is good publicity, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. and I've said this, I've said this before. I hate to agree agree with people who use the term SJW unironically, yeah. but mm. I'm actually I'm actually a little excited about Confederate because at least it's someone. Listen, there's so many people who have written American Civil War alter histories. Mm. Uh, from you know from a variety of different you know races and ethnicities and religions that I think uh, they can probably do it right. It doesn't sound like they're making this as a utopia that this is a good thing. No, it looks like they're definitely going down the route mm. that this is going to be dystopia. That they are going to talk about more about how, how race is in America less than like it would be a great thing if slavery still existed yeah. and the South was independent. <laughs> yeah, like some people sometimes do online. Oh, oh god. Good god. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, but Seat line press doesn't same- have any of those. <laughs> Thank God. In case that needs to be said. Yeah. Oh, um, I mean, I've I've read a couple on the alternate history wiki that that uh, there was one I can't remember what it was called. Um, oh God, now I can't. Remember. I think it was called Our America. So if you guys want to go check it out, you can. Oh, it's great. awful. It's terrible. Yeah. If you really want to see the worst type of American Civil War alternate history, where the South is everything is great about the South winning the war, mm. you want to go check out that. Uh, I don't even know why I'm recommending it. No, don't go <laughs> check out. It's ter- terrible. Uh, but uh, I still think though. It can be done right if mm. you know. And again, in my, and when I did my whole video on it, I'm like, you guys got to get real historians. You yes. guys got to involve African Americans at every level of yeah. filming. You know, you guys have to like. I would even argue get alternate historians in there who know a little bit better, I who've agree. done this before, and be like, no, don't but, be an idiot. That's stupid. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, use it, your critical thinking skills. Definitely, definitely. I mean, I mean, I'm yeah, I'm I'm not. I'm in a slightly different place to you on it, in that like I'm not I'm struggling to get that excited about it. Though I'll probably watch the pilot kind of thing. Oh, um, yeah. I think because on the one hand, yeah, the the my my alternate history lover side is like, well, great, more alternate history on TV, that's good. But I think we talked earlier about this being quite an exciting time. Potentially, we're on the cusp of a golden age of of TV for the for the for the setting. Nearly said genre, mm. um, but. It, it, there's a there's a risk that actually if if it if it's got wrong and it and it actually becomes seen as uh, you know as maybe a just a quite a bad idea for for for, t- for making TV shows and if it becomes I mean because I'll be honest Confederate for the reasons we've kind of just spent ten minutes discussing it sounds like bad alternate history um, and mm. you know it's going to be hard to see how how this world that they've created is going to make sense without it being some kind of um, political point being made. Um, mm-hmm. Which, by the way, can go either way. I've read, you know, I've, I've read, um, you know, left-leaning timelines, right-leaning timelines, um, and whether they are, um, you know, that the, what the author's biases are shouldn't really matter. A, a good, a good piece of, <coughs> excuse me, what I call hard alternate history. I'm pretty sure other people use that term as well. Like, it's someone that examines logically how each cause and effect brings about the world that they're they're writing about. Uh, when something is just like my side wins all the time. <laughs> Um, <laughs> as you say, whether they are a um, you know a, a, a lost cause, a, um, 
for want of a better word, racist, who thinks that the the South should have won and that would have made everything well again, or or a um, you know maybe someone on the far left who thinks that if uh, if communism had been given a chance in the Soviet Union or maybe you know it had been allowed to prosper, then it would have been great and the world would be amazing, that kind of thing. There's mm. you know that that is how you get bad AH, and I worry that the Confederate is more going to be, I don't know, yeah, it it, it it's I don't know what political point they're going to try and make or not make with it. I will say that one of the interesting interesting political points that I saw that somebody speculated could have been made um, by it, um, as a friend of mine mentioned this, he said, he said, what if Confederate comes out and like it's all large sections of it are indistinguishable from our world? What if it's that kind of, it's, it's it like we're going back to CSA, that movie mm -hmm. of like, what if actually large sections of it, you know, a heavily divided, uh, segregated American population, you know, black people treated very differently by the authorities to white people. Doesn't a lot of that sound familiar? Like, yeah, that could be an interesting, <laughs> an interesting story. Um, it just annoyingly it wouldn't really be alternate history if you see what I mean. No, no, and I get yeah. it. And I think that's when a lot of the the whole hashtag No Confederate crowd is pointing out like this is why we don't want Confederate. We mm. think Confederate's a bad idea because we're already dealing with those kind of situations. They yes. haven't really gone away. That's yeah. But the, I completely. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time. A lot of people will sort of dismiss those kind of claims, and maybe by seeing it from an alternate perspective, it might get people to be like, oh, shit, we're not that much better than this alternate world that we mm. know is terrible yeah. kind of thing. Well, so there is potential for this to be good, and also potential that this would be a horrible, bad idea that should never want to, and it should yeah. never be touched. Um, but at the same time, I, I guess as a, just as a pure alternate historian, I'm excited just because, great, more people are doing stuff, and yeah. it's awesome. It, yeah. It's good to see the genre getting out there. I think I think as a final thought on, on Confederate from me, I guess it's I would have liked it if it had been a little bit more imaginative. Um and you know, 'cause I'm I'm not averse to uh to the idea of, of, of Southern Victory timelines. Um, you know, I think Harry Turtledove's series I'd have loved to see Harry Harry Turtledove's Southern Victory World be just be adapted, just if HBO had said, Here we go, let, yeah, let's just adapt that. Um yeah. and give that you know, get the get the Game of Thrones showrunners involved. You know, they they seem to know what they're doing. You know, unfortunately that's not the path they've taken. They're kind of making their own thing and, and whatever. I won't judge it fully until it comes out. Um mm -hmm. but um I think yeah, you're right, it's 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 good to see more alternate history being made. Um but actually it's just it, it it's not also, also like if you were to tell me, Hey Tom, you know, if you told me five years ago, Hey Tom, um there's gonna be two major um alternate history t television shows being made in the states uh what what uh what settings do you think they'll have i would say oh the nazis win and then the confederates win right <laughs> and yeah pretty much sure enough here we are and i i actually think the the worry i mentioned worries a moment ago my worry is that, that is that we're not yet as a as a setting breaking out of that perception in people's minds because the first thing people always say is like, oh what if it over here people always say oh what if hitler won i'm guessing in the states there's slightly more even balance between people saying that or oh right what if the south won um obviously mm -hmm. we don't think about that too much over here but it, it does come up um so yeah that that I'd, I'd like to see more imaginative things and actually i'm excited by i think isn't it is it the amazon show um black america yeah i right? wanted to bring that up eventually great That's, yeah that sounds much yeah. more imaginative uh, like a whole yeah. a brand new nation that never even remotely existed in, in our world being born is, isn't it recon is it part of re reparations are issued after emancipation is that right and it leads to the yeah, creation I, of I, these this state new colonia or something yeah, New Colonia, which is made up of Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Yeah. And, yeah, it's a completely – I like that idea. Of, I'm even more excited about that story than Confederate because Same. Confederate comes off as too much cliché. It's the exactly, standard yeah. South winds of Civil War. Uh, regardless of whether that's a good or bad thing in the mm. end, it's still cliché. The idea, though, of there being this free black state in the South, while it has been done before, it's been done – a hell of a lot less than mm. again the standard confederate timeline yep. and so i would love uh i would love to learn more about the show but again like confederate it was just announced and there's not a lot of details about it we mm. got some bare ideas uh so far so far the reaction to it has been a lot better i haven't seen too much negative except for like deep comment sections where people are being like oh this is just another hate whitey show and i'm like <laughs> really guys i should confederate i should give a chance because it's not going to be racist but yeah. black america <laughs> is going to be racist because yeah. i don't want to say too much because i actually am working on a video my uh, own okay. reaction video to it but uh, I, look forward to that. I am i am still uh very excited about that show because 
it's 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 something you just don't see it's it goes away from the standard kind of like ideas oh. of world war Two or american civil war yeah and so that's the only stuff that ever ever makes it to the mainstream so it's really exciting yeah. to see something uh, obviously this is kind of american civil war related but it's so yeah it's it's so far off the you know like I get that you know with the La Isla Blanca, uh, a, a story that we've published um, on Sea Lion Press about um, the Spanish Armada uh, occupying the Isle of Wight and then the Isle of Wight remaining a, a Spanish territory, just like Gibraltar is in in our world. Yeah. That is that is not going to become an HBO landmark premiere <laughs> television series, no. as much as I would love it to. Um, there are things that you obviously you do need to to, to keep the mainstream in mind. Um, yeah. But yeah. The, 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 there's there's a bit of balance out there you can find and and I think in in in, in Black America they have found a really really exciting idea um, and I'd love to see that kind of imagination be used um, yeah 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 and it's it's a kind of imagination that still people know a little bit about because people it comes out again of the American Civil War and I sort of talked about this a little bit with Stephen Silver when I interviewed him on the blog um, for those who don't know Silver is one of the judges and founder of the Sidewise Awards for Alternate yes, History. He is, yes. um, and he was he, he kind of made a comment that it's really hard for alter history to get into mainstream because you kind of have to know history to be able to really enjoy changing it. Yes. And so that's why I think mainstream there's always going oh, to be a ceiling on how successful it can be. By the way, I think there is there is a big chunk of it that is like feeling clever when you get to a bit where you and you're like ah okay. Whereas actually, if you don't, for example, when I read the the Southern Victory books by by Turtle Dove. I don't know much about the American Civil War, and in fact, still don't. I, I know what happened, but I, you know, I don't know. Uh, I don't really know the battles and the ins and outs. So there were lots of little references to things going different ways that I didn't really catch. So mm -hmm. yeah. So as far back as I can remember, getting into alternate history, that's that's been a factor, and it's why I believe it or not, really like British political alternate history, because <laughs> I know a mm. lot about British politics. But yeah. Anyway, so do go. Yeah. On. Yeah, but it, that's people, at least in the English-speaking world, specifically America, they think they know enough about World War II and American Civil War that they can sort of get it if someone do, did something on, on in a mainstream way, like a film or a TV show, and sort of dumbed it, the history down just enough that people were okay with it. It's kind of was one of the problems with uh, the Fatherland adaptation that HBO did years ago, oh. where they changed the point of divergence from the Enigma Code not being broken to D-Day failure. That's right, yeah. And yeah, because people don't know much about the Enigma Code, but they know about D-Day. Mm -hmm. Now, you can argue that D-Day failing might not lead to a Nazi victory in Europe, but from the point of view of people who thought, who were been told all their life in school that D-Day was really important, yeah, yeah of course if D-Day failed, the Nazis win. Yeah. Uh, because they didn't know what was going on in the Eastern Front. They didn't know what was going on in Italy. They didn't know uh, enough about what was going on in the rest of the world. They, they just knew that D-Day was important. And so that's why HBO made that decision in the end and, you know, whatever. Oh. But, yeah, you can't get too far away from eras of people, the history that people know about because – they don't know what's going on. You know, the the actual history is just as alien and strange to them as the alternate history. Yes. And so it means that in a mainstream setting, alternate historians are going to have to deal with a lot of cliches being done because they just, the rest of the rest of society doesn't really know about them. They haven't really been uh, experienced them. They haven't been exposed to them. So, that's going to happen if, if uh, we're going to see more alternative in the mainstream. We're going to see stories that have been done a million times before, but they've only been done a million times before for a really small group of people. Yeah, good point. Not to, yeah, so it, it's something why I was sort of like, that was my big my biggest concern about Confederate, getting back to that, was that it was just going to be boring because I'm just going to see a story that I've already seen a thousand times before. But I also had to put myself in the mind of someone who hasn't really read a lot of alternate history because I remember when I told my wife about it, who's you know i've introduced her to alternate history stuff like that and she's sort of mild interest in it but she thought oh this is interesting i've never heard about this and i just wanted to say no no but it's been done a thousand times before but yeah. she hasn't <laughs> read those things yeah <laughs> she's never read those stories so to yeah. her this is new and different that's true and that's not a, it's not a slam against her she's a very intelligent woman hmm. but at the same time she just hasn't had that experience that yeah. i've had with alternate history so for her this is an interesting idea it is, yeah. I, th I think the potential, the exciting potential for things like Man in the High Castle and Confederate uh, and Black America is is that for them to be sort of to serve as kind of gateway drugs to get people interested in in alternate history. Like again, putting on my my Sea Line Press hat, I know we're very excited to, to just have more people just aware that the idea exists. You know, because there mm -hmm. are people who who can you know go through their lives and and not really know that there is a whole set of stories about the history being different they just they might just think oh it's just something people wonder about sometimes isn't it no actually yeah. it's you know da, da, da. so yeah definitely it, it it's 
it's it's potentially yeah no it is an exciting time to be interested in alternate history um as i say there's some some potential pitfalls ahead uh, if if we mm. don't you know but actually i think more shows like black america please where things are a yes. bit more imaginative um that sounds really really good to me because um, absolutely yeah I just since getting a little back to Sea Lion Press, oh. is there any kind of story in the Sea Lion Press catalog that you would like to see optioned as either a film or TV series? I'm just curious. Well, um, I have. Oh, okay, there's there's one that I'm not going to lead with because I wrote it, and that would be very self indulgent. <laughs> uh, but um, actually, I've got I've got our full catalog in front of me now. So if there's anything, because there are, I've, I've, as you might expect, I've I've pondered this many a time. Um, I would say that I would I would love to see. Um, I mentioned Look to the West earlier, the the mm. longer than War and Peace epic about um, just the the POD in Look to the West is a guy tripping over and and somebody laughing at him like that's how <laughs> point of divergence that is, um, and that and the world as a result is is unutterably different and it's wonderful. It is it is quite literally a history of the world. I mean I'm sure you read it, but it's it's a history of the world and like everywhere from America. Uh, to England, to China, to India, to the, to South America, it's just the the whole planet is completely different um, within like a generation, and that's really interesting. So that could work as like a sort of fifteen season epic across across <laughs> television, as a kind of, and in fact, I think it would probably be best to do it as like a faux documentary. So in mm. terms of doing, in terms of the more drama stories, the more the more dramatic stories that we've published. Um, I think uh, Paul Hines' Decisive Darkness would, would do very well. That one is, is a different take on, on World War II alternate history. It's what if Japan hadn't surrendered after uh, the bombings of Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki. Um, and uh, basically, there's, there's a, as was attempted in real life, effectively, there, there was a coup by, by various generals who didn't want to surrender. Um, right. Thankfully, mercifully, in real life, it didn't succeed. Um, but in this yeah. world, it does. And uh, the results are absolutely horrible, both for Japan and the wider world. Um, but that is that would make a very interesting kind of multi, kind of Game of Thrones style thing of like different POV characters, um, explore, you know, in American invaders, Russian invaders, um, Japanese civilians, Japanese soldiers, that kind of thing. That could be a really interesting story. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, 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 I've yeah, actually, the loud blast that tears the skies um, would do very well. That is about the, you know the the nineteen oh eight Tunguska event. The uh, the giant yeah. meteor that it turns out um, that 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 meteor struck Siberia on the same I always get this wrong either the line of longitude or the line of latitude that London is on. So if it had landed eight hours later, it would it would have destroyed it London. Would have yeah. destroyed London, and uh, and they had the Olympics going on at the same time in London. If I'm uh, like, uh, Oh if goodness! I'm not wrong. I so that would have yeah. been some. Yeah, it would. Have, yeah, it, it, and and basically the and Chris Nash's uh, very good book about this. Um, it yeah the, the the it slams into central London. He worked out exactly which area of like, the entirety of London is not leveled, but a huge like five mile area in the middle is destroyed. And yeah, it's, it's pretty significant. Uh, it's pretty <laughs> but of course that butterflies uh, or stops rather the the First World War because like America, Europe's energies and alliances are like expend it's a turn towards helping London and, and Britain like recover. And mm. we have a very different 20th century as a result. But like that, as like an open, what I mean, what a pilot episode, um, <laughs> you know, uh, 1908. And then you get a young Winston Churchill um, rising to to be the hero, and and I think that could translate really nicely to to TV. Um, yeah, yeah. And I think I'd I'd be remiss if I didn't mention probably my favourite um, alternate history, um, just because it's so it's so well made, as I call it. Um, like it's really, uh, it, 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 I mentioned earlier, hard alternate history where kind of every choice is justified. Um, mm. And that I think is, is A Greater Britain by Ed Thomas. Um, it's very, very good. Um, it's about Oswald Mosley, most famous for being uh, a fascist anti-Semite piece of SHIT. Um, but um, he was you can say shit. I'll you say, say shit. shit. He was, he was a fascist <laughs> piece of shit. And uh, however, earlier in his career, he before he, he kind of, um, you know, went down a very fascist route and, and aligned himself with Hitler in the 30s. Um, he was uh, a Conservative MP and a Labour MP. And in fact, he walked out of the Labour Party in the early 30s um, after proposing a re economic plan to, to tackle unemployment that was very similar to what FDR would implement in the States a couple of years later. So a man who was mm -hmm. actually went from FDR to Hitler is, is quite an interesting man in the first place. But he, um, basically, Ed wrote an excellent thing where Mosley's position is slightly stronger within the party um, at the time he makes this proposal. And I think it doesn't get adopted, but he feels strong enough to stay after it's rejected. And he ends up becoming a Labour Prime Minister. 
and it's really interesting to see and it, it, it's a just well it's a fantastic piece of work it sees a very very different kind of mid-30s britain and obviously mid-30s europe because of what that means um in terms of uh, rearmament appeasement appeasement just doesn't happen things like that um but that kind of that that era is really interesting to look at um it's kind of it's got a very different world war Two. like world war Two doesn't not to give anything away but it doesn't really happen the same way you expect it to um, mm -hmm. And I think that would that would translate really well. And Mosley himself is a, is a really interesting character. Um, and finally, I said I wouldn't lead with with my own work, but I, I have to say, <laughs> I do think. And actually, basically, a lot of readers have, have actually said to said to me and Jack, who wrote Agent Lavender: The Flight of Harold Wilson, that it would work really well as a TV show um, because it is all about you know it's about the Prime Minister being a spy. Um, it involves the Prime Minister escaping. Uh, across East Anglia and trying to get to a Russian submarine. It's got quite. It's actually got quite a few action sequences and like everything from tanks to hand-to-hand -hand combat and things like that. And it has cameos from pretty much every famous Western fig Western political figure in in the mid 70s, um, and most of the Soviets as well. So I think that could. Um, yeah, obviously I can't go on about it too much, but uh, I think that one <laughs> I can see why people still think it would translate very well. And when I'm dreaming in the shower I do think about it and uh, think it could be very cool and I wonder who I'd cast as Wilson and things like that um, okay so there's a few there's a few and I'm, I've I'm def definitely missed out on a couple oh actually yeah not an English word by Tom Anderson um, is a w I definitely can't tell you what it's about because it's kind of a, a twist ending but um, that one involves a, uh, a sort of a ritual that's that brings back uh, a leader of the Liberal Party uh, from the dead, <laughs> and uh, and uh, he's uh, he arrives and transforms the fortunes of the coalition era Liberal Democrats in the UK um, via various ridiculous means at various points that would really lend themselves to TV or Hollywood, and uh, yeah, and the ending reveal of who he who he really is, who who, who they brought back because I think they wanted to bring back Lloyd George, but the ritual goes wrong and they bring back the wrong one. Oh, no, they want to bring Gladstone, oh, I think. Um, but they don't get Gladstone; they get somebody else. Um, but yeah, oh. brilliant story, and that one again because it's slightly pulpy, would work really well as uh, as a TV piece. Um, but yeah, there's there's a we published a lot of a lot of great of, of great stuff, um, and a lot of them, you know, prob some of them probably aren't suitable for for TV. There's some that might work as like radio dramas. We published a couple of quite short, intimate stories, things like that, um, and we have a couple of military epics that arguably might work better as kind of mockumentaries. Um, actually, something like Festung Europa. Um, the sheer scale of that, that's about the Soviets being knocked out in 1943 and the Americans and the British having to finish the, the war on their, on their own and it takes like 15 years and is utterly horrible and bloody. Um, that would probably be quite exhausting as, a, as, a, as like a conventional drama but could work quite nicely as a kind of, a kind of remake of the world at war but about an alternate world. Yeah, okay. Uh, that all sounds really cool. So, yeah. Um, you did put a lot of th thought into some of those, i got to say. Um, I'm <laughs> yeah, well, as, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, in, in my other life, I'm a, I'm a playwright and would love to write for the screen someday. So I've always had a kind of, you know, yeah, I've had a sort of TV mind. So I, I like thinking about what stories would work out there. Well, hopefully one day we'll actually see one of those stories uh, get on the small or big screen. So uh, since we are getting close to uh, the end time here, oh. just going to do a last couple things to wrap up. Of course. So I know uh, Sea Lion Press just recently announced Phase 6. So yes. are, are you going to – is there anything you want to tease about Phase 7? Well, Phase 7, uh, yeah, obviously uh, for, for newcomers to, to Sea Lion Press, um, we kind of we do all of our books in, in, in waves and phases, as you say. Um, and, uh, yeah, Phase 6, we added another 11 books to our output. Uh, before we do Phase 7, we're actually going to uh, publish a slew of our existing catalogue in print because we launched paperback books at the end of last year. Um, six of our titles are available there now. You can find them under Our Books and then Paperbacks on our website. Um, and, uh, yeah, we've got, I think, eight or nine of our existing catalogue uh, kind of the longer and, and, and um, the longer and heftier books um, that lend themselves to, to a really good read on the beach uh, when you're on holiday with a print book um, are, are coming very soon I think uh, um, uh, what do you call it A Greater Britain which I mentioned earlier by Ed Thomas is coming um, along with uh, Festung Europa the war epic that I mentioned uh, with Iron and Fire our first book about China uh, is really exciting it's about different uh, about a, a kind of different, a very different path for China in the 20th century. Uh, Uncharted mm -hmm. Territory, part two of the Look to the West epic that I talked about earlier, uh, along with Time Wreck Titanic, uh, which is a kind of thriller about um, a fleet of uh, memorial ships and warships 
uh, going across the sea in a memorial fleet for the Titanic in the year 2012, and then it just so happens that a freak wormhole throws them back in time 100 years to the night the Titanic is sinking, and they find themselves in a very strange position indeed. Um, mm. and also, we've got the fourth and fifth lectins, uh, they're or the fourth lectin and the fifth lectin by Andy Cook. They're great political uh, British political stories um, that are coming out, and the world of Fight and Be Right, the follow-up to Fight and Be Right, which was a very successful book by Ed Thomas. All of those and a couple more will hopefully be hitting uh, the printing presses in uh, September. Um, and then beyond that, um, I guess uh, the main thing to say with with Phase Seven and Eight, Nine, Ten, Eleven is that we're always looking for for more uh, titles. As I say, a number of our books now have been people who've come to us and said, "Look, would you read my manuscript?" Um, I'm pleased to say we've got a couple of new authors coming this time. Uh, a guy called Steve Kingston has written a very good story called The Sea Eagles. Uh, actually, again about a teleporting ship, but it's about a Bundesmarine ship uh, going back to uh, World War Two. Uh, we've got Alexander Rooksmore. Uh, he's written The Eve of the Globe's War, which is effectively 1938 in a world where there was no industrial revolution. Um, and still a kind of a massive global conflict is on the, the, the verge of breaking out. So if you ever wondered what Winston Churchill would look like if he uh, smoked a pipe rather than a cigar and walked around in a tricorn hat then that's going to be for you. <laughs> um, and uh, we've got a series of kind of uh, a series of short stories and, and ruminations by uh, Professor Tim Venning, um, which is uh, quite exciting. He's written King Charles or King Oliver is coming out with us um, again. I say, I say phase seven should be something like October, November time. As I say, we're focusing on the print stuff at the moment and September's only around the corner. But these will all be okay. definitely available before Christmas. And uh, oh yes, the the Darling Buds Express, um, a very kind of one of our more personal and intimate alternate histories. We like to. I mentioned brings me right back to my point about um, you know alternate history being a setting, not a genre. Uh, this is definitely it's actually a very human story, the Darling Buds Express. I won't give anything away, but it's uh, it it's, uh, it seems like quite a simple, quite a sweet love story. But the world in which it's taking place gradually becomes clear to be very different to ours. So you should keep an eye out for that one. And uh, and a lot more, as I say. So, uh, oh, and the Stuart sequence. I mentioned that earlier. The uh, the fourth volume of that is coming out. So, uh, if you're a fan of George Kitten's books, keep an eye out for that one. All right, cool. And if someone wanted to uh, purchase these books, uh, where would they go? Uh, the best place to go is sealionpress.co.uk um, because if you then go to our books, you can see our entire catalog there. And uh, on each page for for each book, you can see a button that says buy on Amazon or buy elsewhere. Um, so you can go straight to Amazon, or if you prefer, you can use one of various uh, one of the various other ebook retailers. Uh, we're migrating all of our books over to these other retailers at the moment. And if you're interested in a paperback, then uh, just roll over the our books button and click onto paperbacks, and you can get our existing paperbacks. So that's sealionpress.co.uk. All right, awesome. And for those listeners, I will uh, put this link in uh, the notes for the episode on YouTube. So great. don't worry. Uh, you can just click on there, too. Yeah. So, um, all right, uh, Tom, it's been great talking with you. Hey, no, so, pleasure. Thanks so much for having me on, Matt. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem, no problem. And, um, well, guys, uh, I'm Matt Mitrich, the alternate story, and with me today was Tom Black of Sea Lion Press. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye.